Welcome to Journey Home to Self. This is a place for us to explore the milestones, the roadblocks, the pit stops and the breathtaking sights on the most important journey of our lives. The journey of coming back home to you. My hope is that through the stories, insights, knowledge and wisdom we share here, you get inspired and activated to wildly fall in love with choosing yourself every single moment. I'm your host Deepshikha Sairam and I am truly so excited and honored that you are here. Let's dive in and journey home to self together. Do you have a big, hairy, audacious goal for 2023? Me too. In fact, I have several. Maybe you do too. Did you know that out of all the people who set New Year goals, a staggering 92% don't achieve them? Now, there are a lot of reasons behind that. The goal itself, the timeline, and many other. But one of the main reasons is that people don't even take action on their goals or fall short of it. 72% quit even before they have begun. This is not because they lack the skills for it, but because of a limiting belief behind it, such as, I'm not good enough. I don't deserve it. It'll never happen for me. Only if I was 10 pounds thinner. Or if I was a morning person. If I had a different childhood. Or if I drank kombucha. You know the drill. Chances are you have the same or a different limiting belief that keeps you paralyzed from taking action, big or small. I know the feeling. But have you ever wondered what lies beyond that limiting belief? If you're curious, I want you to check out the super awesome limited time offer Beyond Belief. I want to help you break through your limiting beliefs, take unstoppable action, and achieve your goals with effortless success. Beyond Belief is a powerful trifecta of the emotion code, which is an energy healing modality, EFT, also known as tapping, and an intuitively guided customized ritual to break through your resistance and limiting beliefs so you can take unstoppable action towards your 2023 goals. And yes, even that big, hairy, audacious goal. Your limiting beliefs are nothing but these balls of slimy, gooey, stuck, yucky energy. This stuck energy, often called as blocks, literally block the flow of your life source energy, also known as chi or prana. In Beyond Belief, we are removing these energy blocks and allowing the creative chi to flow through without disturbance. When you do this, there's a release of energy which was previously invested in keeping that belief system up, in believing in it, resisting it, fearing from it, worrying about it. How much time and energy do you give to those limiting beliefs? When we remove those energy blocks, that resistance, that limiting belief, now that previously stuck energy becomes available to you for creative projects, problem solving, and taking massive action. Most people who go through Beyond Belief feel this rush of energy inside them and they can't stop themselves from taking action and they are excited about their goals. Instead of their limiting beliefs weighing them down, now they feel free and empowered and ready to take action. Every action you take creates forward momentum towards your goals, whether it's big or small. Now, If you are ready to free yourself from the chains of the past limiting beliefs, I am more than ready to help you achieve your goals with effortless success. Check out Beyond Belief. There's a link in the show notes to know what's included in the session, how we'll roll, and to book your session at a crazy discounted price right now. But hurry, because the offer is only valid till January 31st. And now, let's go on to today's episode. Please note, this episode has a trigger warning for discussions of eating disorders. Listening, discretion advised. Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Journey Home to Self. My guest today is such a special friend and I just love talking to her anytime I can get a chance. 
Dr. Cindy, the expert's ghostwriter. She is a ghostwriter for entrepreneurs that wants to write books that makes money and make an impact. Her clients achieve bestseller status, give TEDx talks, win book awards, sign book deals, and more. She won gold for Business of the Year, Media and Entertainment with the American Business Awards in 2022. And in her spare time, Dr. Cindy fosters rescue cats and kittens, which is the focus of her forthcoming memoir. I am just so excited to talk to Dr. Cindy today. And I just happened to see a side of her foster mom right before we hit record. And we'll probably talk about this. But I love talking to Cindy. We've any occasion that we've had and we've met in person a couple of times because she's just such a great storyteller. Like whenever I've spoken to her, I have just been so enigmatically involved in her stories. Cindy, welcome to the show. I have a little foster cat right here. Meet Cinnamon. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, thank you, Deepshika. I'm so happy to be here. I love your new podcast. As soon as I heard the topic, I was like, this is going to be amazing. Oh, I am so, so honored that you said that. I'm excited. I'm so juiced up. I wrote you an email yesterday. And the fun fact is I was thinking about what we're going to talk about. And of course, we have our own topics. And I, uh, you know, to the listeners, I wrote about three kind of like, you know, broad strokes that we were going to talk about. And then Cindy comes back and says, I love the arc that you provided here. And I'm like, arc? What arc? And when I went back and looked at it, I'm like, yeah, there is an arc. (laughs) I'm telling this small incident just to stress that you're so good at what you do. You're so good at seeing the story. I'm curious, were you always a great storyteller? Were you always like this when you were growing up? I think this side of me has always been there. Like I always wanted to write, like when I was in fourth grade, I wrote my first story and even when, even younger than that in spelling, you know, there would be like the words of the week, like town, brown, whatever. And I didn't want to use the words from the word bank. So I would like make a bad grade because I would (laughs) be like, I have a much better sentence to write here. And it requires a word that's not in the word bank. So Uh Uh (laughs) the teacher would be like, this is, this is the spelled correctly, but it's not one of the words of the week. And I'm like, I know. Our education system. That's a whole different topic to discuss. Yes. But do you do you remember the first time that you fell in love with stories or words or language? I mean, probably even before I could remember, like, so two things I love besides cats. So really like there are three loves of my life. They would be like words, cats, and fashion. And apparently Mm -hmm. when I was like two years old, I would take a writing utensil and paper and I would say I was drawing girls. So I was, I was trying to draw fashion. I was trying to draw (laughs) like, you know, and I would also write stories. So I would go like this long before I learned penmanship. (laughs) Wow. And I just... I had something I needed to say and I just, um, yeah, I didn't know how to do it yet. Yeah. And this is such a great example. And that's why, you know, I absolutely loving having you on the show is such a great example of the essence that you were born with, right? That's, that's the self that we talk about. You know, I define self as the, our identity self and the self which is a higher self. And you have managed to make these three loves of your life a part of our life today, a part of your life today. And it's it's so um it's so beautiful to see. I read this, I think it was a blog or an article on your website about a time in your life which was very hard. And even just the way that you wrote that article and then the lesson that you gave in the end, it was beautiful. We link that up because I would love for everybody to see, you know, the art, the craft of writing. But could you tell us a little bit more about that story and what impact did that happen on your life? Yeah. So um, when I was five years old, my mother put me on my first diet. But the way we got there was every week our teacher would feature a student with, she would like outline your body and then you would like color it in. 
And mm-hmm. mine was awesome. I wore my black skirt and I had a pink and purple sweater that I loved. And it had a black collar and black on the wrists. And it was on point. And as I was coloring, because my hair was not as curly as I wanted it to be, I would always go like this to try to make it curlier. Mm-hmm. Um, so I drew myself curls because I was like, this is going to be even better. And so I was so proud of this. All the kids in the whole school like walked by it all week. And I was just, I was the superstar. And then my mom comes um, on Friday to pick me up and the teacher takes down your picture and you bring it home with you. And my mom asked her how my weight compared to another girl in the class. And she had just been featured like a couple of weeks before she was a B, I was a C Childress. And Basically, she weighed 50 pounds and I weighed 55 pounds. And with that, my mother grabbed my wrist and she said, I'm putting you on a diet. And she dragged me down the hall of the elementary school and she informed me what I was not going to eat anymore, what I was now going to be allowed to eat and in what amount and when. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely rejected this with every fiber of my body. She Also, informed me my picture looks like I hadn't even tried, and she didn't know if she was going to keep it or not. And in one fell swoop, the person who should have been who I looked to to help me develop a healthy sense of self destroyed what I had and left me with a lot of anger to process. And So I I was a compulsive overeater all the way to college and then more eating disorders. And, you know, it was a long struggle to get back to me. And part of that healing journey included EMDR with one of many therapists that I saw. She was actually the last therapist because she was the one that actually broke the hold the story had on me. And what we did was it was a combination of writing and using the MDR technique, but she had me like write this, the trauma story, write everything I remembered from the first thing that happened, pretty much the way I told it today. And then she would have me repeat it over and over with these little vibrating paddles, which they didn't hurt or anything, but what they did is force me to be present for the memory so that I could process it. And what happened through going through this work and writing the story over and over again I found the me before the traumatic incident. I recovered the joy I had as that little girl drawing the picture of myself, absolutely thrilled with every bit of it. And I realized I could put her in charge. I could decide that she has permission to speak. She, you know, where she was told to be quiet, you're wrong, you're not enough, you're unacceptable. I told her, you are fabulous. You are more than acceptable. You you need to be in charge of this wardrobe because you have the vision and the passion and you love yourself. And so, you know, I really, um, in recovering the memory, I recovered that part of myself. And that, you know, is probably why I'm a little bit unusual today because (laughs) I've, um, I've got this inner child on the journey with me and you know she's she's front and center she's important yeah wow that is such a beautiful story and obviously I know that side of you that you discovered or rediscovered or remembered after your healing journey but during those years and you were five at the time when it happened so you were very very young and those are the developing years those those are the years when we are forming the positive and the negative association from the world around us during Mm -hmm. those years from when you had this incident to when you started your healing what was your life like at that time what was your thought process like how uh, how did you behave in this world yeah I mean I well eating disorders is a big one so I was a compulsive overeater to age 18. You know, eating was my revenge for all the diets that I made sure failed. But then once I got to college and I was eating with my peers in the lunchroom and I didn't have anybody to rebel against with my food choices. And so I pretty much just ate what my peers ate. 
And just by doing that a lot and the walking I did on campus, which was more exercise than I'd ever gotten before, I lost 10 pounds really quickly. And I was like, that was crazy. That's not a kind of thing that happens for people like me. And then I thought, well, I wonder if I tried to lose weight on purpose. So this I discovered um, not advice, do not do this anyone, but I discovered this 1000 calorie diet where you had a goal of 20 grams of fat a day. And so the weight continued to come off and continued to come off. And because when I'd lost a little in the beginning and people said, oh, Cindy, you look so great now. And I'd be like, no, I'm going to let you know when I look great. Then as I got quite thin and then all the way to too thin and people were still telling me, I think you're okay. I don't think you need to lose any more weight. I would still be like, no, I will decide when that is. Mm. And um, I got to a point where I was so weak from anorexia that I couldn't walk very far or, and so I'm laying on my couch reading a glamour magazine and I'm doing it like this for a reason. And there's an article about an anorexic girl and I'm reading the article and I'm thinking those people are just jealous of her because she has better self-control than them. And I'm like, she's actually not too thin. She looks great. That's what I'm thinking. And I could see my arms And I could see her arms and I realized my arms looked like her arms. And I realized, oh, I wonder if I also have anorexia. And within a few days, I realized because I was having fainting spells. I mean, this was not sustainable. And I realized that I was going to have to eat more. And then I discovered bulimia very shortly after. And so that saved my life. So thank you, bulimia. Also, it stayed long after I didn't need it anymore. That became my new coping mechanism for um, dealing with my emotions, um, which I avoided. Avoid was like the big thing that I did with emotions. And really this, when I was 24, I was about to take my comprehensive exams for my PhD. And I realized that with all the amount of time and energy I spent binging and purging, I was never going to be able to study sufficient to do well on those exams. I knew this because I only barely passed my master's comprehensive exams, which were not as extensive. So I knew this. I had to change something. So I applied to the New York State Psychiatric Institute um, with Columbia University. They have a research program on eating disorders. And miraculously, I was accepted into the program. It was free because I didn't have any money to pay for this. I was a poor college student and my parents didn't know I had an eating disorder. And I say no in quotation marks. How could they not know? But anyway, I went there. I got help. I was stabilized. And I mean, one thing that happened is I got permission to eat because so this drove the anorexic girls crazy. But as a bulimic girl at that time, when they would give us a tray of food that was selected by a nutritionist, and they did let us meet the nutritionist and talk to her and really felt like she knew us and cared about us. I knew she had selected my meal for me. And I also knew everything on this tray I was permitted to eat because she had promised me, and and this promise held true, that if I ate what she picked for me, what was, what was safe to eat, that I would not gain weight, which was my big fear that the only way I could not gain weight would be if I threw up after I ate. And I followed the program and I ate what, like, it was like getting permission to eat this much food Mm -hmm. was like a new way to look at it. And so I left the program with the new tools and, you know, structure in place. And I won't say that, you know, this is, And I really love that new um, memoir that just came out. I'm glad my mom died. Mm -hmm. And in it, the author, uh, her name escapes me in this moment, but in it, she talks about how bulimia is not something you stop, like, you know, with alcoholism, you can, and people do stop and they get chips and it's, you know, but bulimia is more of a thing where, you know, you have a slip and then you try to learn from it and you try to do better. And then, you know, sometimes you're doing better than you are other times, but you have to keep trying. And that's the, but what actually was the like universe kick in the butt that was unavoidable is I had um, a severely herniated L5 and I had discotomy surgery. And with that, I couldn't throw up anymore. I actually couldn't. It would give me severe back pain and sciatica. And um, 
you know, which I think is my body taking care of me. And so I just had to say, okay, I'm not starving myself to be thin. That is not a long-term strategy. I cannot binge and purge ever again. It is unless if I like don't want to be in chronic pain, it would not work. I would send myself back to surgery. So it's like, okay, I'm stuck here in this shell that I have, and there's no way I can outsmart it or work around it. I'm going to have to be in it. And, you know, recovering from back surgery, I couldn't even move very much. I also had exercise addiction. I was what you might call um, an eating disorder tourist. I tried all of them, but I couldn't even exercise away. It was just me in my body resting. And, you know, I had no choice but to figure it out and just have to be okay and just say, you know, I always wanted to meet who Cindy would be if she didn't spend so much time and energy on her weight. And Mm -hmm. that's the Cindy you met, Deep Sheikah, because I don't care. You know, I, I, I do care that I have proper nutrition and I eat a healthy diet and I'm vegetarian and I get movement because it feels good, but I don't care. Um, is someone thinner than me? Am I what size are my clothes? If it's a problem, I just cut the size label out. I'm like, I just need this to fit. Yeah. And anytime I gain weight, I buy new clothes for the size I am. I never make myself and I don't like try something on sale and be like, oh, I just need five pounds and it'll be perfect. I never buy that. I love me just as I am, however I am. And I make sure that I have comfortable, fashionable clothes that fit whatever is going on here, because that is what that little girl inside of me wants. Yeah. Wow. This is such a fascinating story, Cindy. And a few episodes before I took the listeners through the journey home to self framework as I see it. And in your story, I can see you going through that entire framework. It is, and of course, this has to be a very difficult time in our life, but I can also see how those moments were pivotal for you. Yes. I want to know, what was your darkest night of the soul? Because I do believe that we all have to reach that lowest of the lowest of point from where on we have to pivot. What was that for you? Yeah, well, that was literally me. So like my back had gone out and I had an MRI scheduled through my general doctor and she had put me on steroids and I could be at home. I couldn't move around very much, but I could still binge and purge. And so I had binged a little bit of food. And then as I was throwing it up, that's when I had the back spasm of all back spasms and I peed on myself and I was laying on the floor And the back spasms were so severe and I was in so much pain that I couldn't get up. I couldn't move. In fact, I laid there for two hours until my husband found me on the floor. Oh, I made sure the toilet was flushed, by the way. But, um, you know, (laughs) laying there on the floor, soiled, unable to move. And he had to call um, an ambulance because he couldn't move me either. I was in such severe pain. I was in such severe pain. The medics almost couldn't move me either. They had to put me on a board, which was still incredibly painful. I was like, it was, it was, you know, that's what severe herniation is because the, um, like there's a sac that protects your vertebra and the very last barrier of protection is actually this, there's a fancy word for it. That's technical, but this toxic ooze comes out that absolutely says this must stop. And it's that toxic ooze that um, is like your back protecting itself, the last thing it has. And that is what I was feeling. And so I needed surgery. Yeah. It's also pretty symbolic, right? That very much ooze coming out. It's almost like, you know, of course, I'm a highly spiritual person and I can feel that this was like your highest self and someone taking care of you and saying that I'm sorry honey this is gonna this is gonna cause you a shit ton of pain but you have to go through it in order to get your life back in order yes that was exactly what it was and as I laid there when I was you know waiting for my husband to get home like the pain was so bad 
but I wasn't blacking out. I was just there with the pain. And I was like, this is, and I had the awareness. I feel like I'm going to die, but this is not going to kill me. I'm going to live through this. I just need to tough it out. Oh, I have goosebumps. It's that the final purge and the death and rebirth, right? Like Mm -hmm. I'm going, oh, I, oh, I love this. Totally love the story. What would you say to anyone who is there right now? either in, and you had both pendulums, right? Actually, all the pendulums, you would overeat and then anorexia and then bulimia. You're like, it was swinging the furthest. What would you say someone who's there and knows that they want to stop, but cannot stop? What would be your biggest advice to them? I would say, forgive yourself. Mm -hmm. It's not your fault that you're not where you want to be yet on your healing journey. And it's okay if this is not the moment that you turn around and after this, everything changes, but just know that it can change. And I believe that you will, and just have the courage to take the small steps that you can take and keep taking those small steps. And like, try not to wait all the way to like, you're having back spasms and you need surgery. But if you do get there, if you are there now, just know there's something amazing on the other side. And I can't wait to meet who you you are without your eating disorder. Oh, I'm going to cry. And I think this is a message that everybody can find some solace in, like even me, like anybody who is on their journey to self. With many of our human problems and conditions and everything, we can we can take solace in that with the, the therapy and everything that you did. And I'm so glad that you got help and you got it, like you received help. Do you think that the the incident with the cutout and that memory was the core at it? Was that the that the starting point? That was what I figured out with the therapist. And to this day, I would say that was, um, there's like another significant trauma around my kittens. And, you know, maybe that's a story for another time. So I had to heal. So there were two traumatic memories that were so at the core of my identity. And I had to heal that other one as well. But for the eating disorder, I mean, it was nothing short of a miracle that after I tapped into that girl, I mean, I just didn't care about those things I used to care about and the way that I cared about them. It was yeah. just a complete flip of like my values and what was important to me. Yeah, yeah. My experience with healing some of my childhood trauma has been that once I once it was healed, there was so much of a release of an energy. And I felt that all that energy now came back to me to experience higher levels of joy and contentment. And that energy was available for my creative projects as well. Like I love to write, I love to dance, I love to do this, like recording a podcast. And suddenly I felt that now I was able to do that with much more freedom. Was that your experience? Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, I started writing a novel. I mean, in fact, eight months after my back surgery. So two months after my back surgery, I decided I needed some professional development. So I joined a women's networking group and I was like, wow, this is, these women are really cool. They're, I I wish I was as exciting as them. And so then, you know, six months after I joined that group, I started my business in 2017. So that, you know, who am I without my eating disorder? You know, it's the trophies behind me. It's the books that I've worked on. It's the clients I've helped in many ways and um, the foster cats that I foster. And that's, you know, it's, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And you also traveled a lot with your husband. And you've had such amazing and exciting stories. I mean, I I was telling somebody long time ago that I can just sit with Cindy and listen to her travel Mm -hmm. stories all the time. There was this one particular incident that you shared, if you don't mind sharing, when you applied for a job and you were, were you denied it? Can you can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, yes. So I when I finished my PhD, my husband, um, got an opportunity to live and work in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Mm -hmm. So I went with him. So that's why I didn't pursue a traditional academic career. 
but I didn't realize that was what this choice meant because Malaysia has plenty of English speaking universities. So I thought I would just apply to them and teach there. And so when I got there, it just was not that way because I was on a dependent visa and they were, you know, just reciprocating what America did. So the Malaysian wife would be on a dependent visa, unable to work here. So the same thing happened there. So I understood that, but also it put me in quite a position. Um, but it was possible to get out of it. But someone would have to pay a lot of money. So anyway, um, I got hooked up with the Islamic University of Malaysia. And I went on campus to interview and I had to wear a headscarf. So I do know how to wrap one. And I wore very loose fitting clothing that would be appropriate. And my subject matter areas included feminist theory and literature. So this was um, a particular a sticking point they wanted to talk about pretty thoroughly, but I wowed them by choosing to focus on material feminism about, you know, wanting to be treated equally under the law. I looked at finding a journey of her peers mm-hmm. and, you know, equal wages and, you know, the yellow wallpaper and women being treated <laughs> as Like things are just all in our head, you know, but, you know, so like I kept it to those kind of things that were not controversial even there. And so they invited me back to campus to present a whole hour on feminism and literature, which I did to their happiness. And they had some women faculty present and they were very excited. So this was all going very well. And then I had my final interview where I had to go in front of the rector, who was kind of like, like the provost. And all of the deans at this long table, it was like Kafka's The Trial. And I walk in and there's like one chair here and then everyone else is at the other side of this very long table. You cannot even make eye contact with everyone. And so they didn't invite me to sit either. I had to figure it out. So, uh, you know, so I sit down. I go through that interview, which was very tough as well. Um, They even asked me, how would I approach Islam in my literature? Because it's a requirement of that religious school that it be a focus. And I literally said, you know, I would rely on the advisement of um, (laughs) my peers because I was also going to have to have all my syllabi and lesson plans approved by someone. So I also said I'm a big fan of student-led discussions, so I would appreciate input on those discussion questions, and then I would really, you know, leave it to the students. So, I mean, I thought it was very good, but what happened is Turkey was sending a flotilla of aid to Palestine, and Israel bombed it, and this sparked protests at the American embassy and elsewhere in Kuala Lumpur, and through all of these interviews, they would ask me, do you feel safe here? And I would always say, of course, I feel safe in Malaysia. I've lived here for more than a year. Um, I love the people. I take the subway, um, go to the uh, wet market. I'm happy here. I hadn't understood the question properly. What they were afraid of were people on campus protesting if this Western woman were to be on faculty, or when these kinds of things happened, would I attract those protests to this campus? Mm. So I did not get the job. And I was very resentful at that time, but that was in like 2009. But today in 2022, I honestly think they did make a good choice. I don't resent that I didn't get that opportunity. And, you know, it's, it was still a really interesting experience that I'm glad I had. Wow. And I'm so glad that you stuck to your guns and you, you know, you did what you thought was right for you. Did you start your business after that? Was a business, uh, you know, something that you were like, okay, I I don't have this, but I'm going to do something of my own? Well, I I kind of always was interested in entrepreneurship. My dad's father was a dairy farmer and he, you know, raised beef cattle and, you know, lots of different crops, corn, soybeans, tobacco. So I'd seen that. But, you know, my parents were not entrepreneurs and but I always thought it was interesting, but also felt like I didn't think that I could actually do it. And there was like when we moved back to America, there was a period when I was applying for jobs and I couldn't get hired for anything because at that point I had a seven year work gap. So for a lot of things, my education was too much, but I started leaving it off my resume. But that didn't even that was not the reason I was having not even able to get interviews. It was the seven years. So. I became a certified personal trainer and became, um, you know, worked at a gym 
Wow. So there I am in a uniform starting at, you know, 5 a.m. with my first client. <laughs> and uh, interestingly, you were back to fitness in a very different way. A very different way. And the interesting thing is, though, the approach of this gym is slow motion strength training. So it's just 20 minutes twice a week only strength training. So it was actually teaching a very healthy form of exercise. And I was so nurturing to my clients and they all loved me, which is not surprising. And I did help people lose weight in healthy ways. We did the whole 30 diet, you know, it was like, you know, let's just eat clean and see what happens, which was fantastic and a good thing. And then I the, like I was doing better than most any other trainers in the company with my sales and my phone conversions. So they, um, what corresponded with my back going out when I could no longer be a trainer in the gym was um, they promoted me to do sales scripts and sales training for the 1-800 staff. And I wrote a sales training manual for the trainers and, you know, like all this technical writing. And um, they really had gotten to a point where there weren't like a lot more obvious things for me to write for them. And I was crying to my husband. I was like, you know, I would started applying for jobs again. And the only thing I found was like this law firm that wanted me to write recommendation letters. And it was $34,000 a year. And the only upward mobility was maybe they would need a new manager for the like group at some point. And I was like, this just doesn't sound happy. Um, and my husband said, well, why don't you start a business? Mm-hmm. And I said, what do you mean? Like a Subway franchise? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no, start your own business. And I was like, what would I sell? And then he said, sell writing. And I was like, who would buy it? And he was like, <laughs> Well, I don't know, but you're going to have to start it and just see. And so that very night through my tears, I bought my first website domain and registered with Squarespace. I ordered business cards and I contacted a friend who was a lawyer about how to be legit. And within two weeks, I signed my first full website copy deal that was so much work. I had to go back to the gym and say, I'm going to need to reduce my hours because this thing is taking off. And they were very kind to work with me. I um, just have not um, nothing but nice things to say about the experience with that company. But yeah, and then I blossomed to children's here business. You are. Yes. No, here you are. What a full circle. I just love your storytelling. Cindy, you, your self-expression in your business is exactly of who you are like we have a lot of business owners and most of us you know we try to become someone else we try to become a version of someone else and when we talk about authenticity that is what authenticity to me means it is a true expression of yourself of course it's taken a lot of time and it's been a journey for you to get here but you're very aware of the persona that you you put forward tell me a little bit about you know, how does it come easily to you? Like who, if I, if someone were to ask you, who are you, Cindy, in your business and in your life, what would you say to them? Yeah, I would say uh, I'm still this like nerdy cat lady <laughs> who just loves books and writing and fashion. Like that's, <laughs> that's, that that is just who I am. You know, we would add a little travel to that, but you know, those are the things that I was as an expat wife in Malaysia with no job. <laughs> And no work identity whatsoever. I was still all of those things. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I'm i all of those things in my business. You know, I'm wearing a cat shirt today. I showed you a kitten a minute ago. Yeah. Like, it's all here. It's all, you know, part of the Cindy show. And I think really what I would say the most, more than anything, is for some reason through these experiences, I have a very deep compassion for people Mm -hmm. and empathy with people. And I think when my ghostwriting clients, you know, have difficult stories to share sometimes difficult in all kinds of different ways. And I can hold space for however, whatever that story is and however 
it's showing up in the moment and, you know, helping them take care of themselves and be present with it and also finding meaning in it. Because when you write like book length, things come out that you didn't realize before. You see things in ways you hadn't before. And taking that journey together is just, it's such a pleasure. And it's one that, you know, for me to be there with my clients, I also have to be authentic and true or else if I'm just trying to cover up all this stuff and distort myself, how am I going to help them do what they need to do on the page to reach their reader? So it's, um, it's walking the talk. That's, that's a very uh, beautiful perspective to it that, you know, you, in order to bring out the authentic stories in your clients, you also have to own it and you do own it. Was there at any point of time where you compelled or, you know, you saw someone and you were like, oh, maybe I shouldn't be too fashion-y or I shouldn't talk about my cat so much. Was there any moments in your life where you were like, okay, maybe I shouldn't, maybe it's becoming too much, but you stuck to your guns? Yes, definitely with fashion, because I don't just like fashion. I like high fashion. This yeah. is Alice and Olivia. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, um, Chanel handbags and Jimmy Choo shoes. And it was a little bit hard for me to share that part of myself, um, which sounds weird because you know, on social media, everybody wants to be flashy. So yeah. I wasn't I over eager to join the flashiness. But um, I'm so concerned about other people and how they might feel. And I know a lot of people look at those pictures and they feel bad about themselves in relationship to that other person and what they have. And the last thing I would want is to make anyone feel that way. But the cool thing is I have found a way to share this joy for these luxury goods without bragging, without saying obnoxious things like, if you work this hard, you can have this too. Yes. Instead, what I do is just invite you into the joy. There will be a picture of me at Dior with my stylist, Awa Tef. And if I, she knows in advance I'm coming, she'll have macaroons for me and mm -hmm. a little miniature champagne. And I'll be trying on things and we'll have a picture of me enjoying this moment and enjoying this stylish hat. But it's more than that. It's like the the joy is really the point more than like how much does the thing cost? And um, I know I'm doing it right when people see my Chanel purse and they tell me, oh, I love your coach bag. Now, the reason I say <laughs> doing it right is because I'm not making it about Chanel. Yes. Um, I'm making it about this beautiful thing that I have that I enjoy and whatever other people see and think about and whatever meaning they assign to it is what they would enjoy yeah. and care about. And that is the point. Totally. I totally agree with you. You know, it is, it is about not judging ourselves and being who we are. And if you are someone who enjoys high fashion, if you're someone who enjoys that thing, it also comes out authentically. It's, it's when people you know, when, and we see all these kind of posts on social media, when we are trying to use that as an ego thing and trying to uplift our status in the society, that's when it comes across as showy or too much. But when I see you and I am the same and I've had the same moments in my life where I felt like, oh my God, am I going to be judged for liking expensive clothing? Like just this, we're shooting this episode right after Black Friday and I love expensive jeans. I just do. I cannot go to a Marshalls and buy a $20 jeans. I love my rag and bone. I love my seven for mankind. I, I agree. I don't yeah, wear anything but sevens. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm actually wearing one and it just got it and I wore it and I was like, oh my God, I am in love. And I wear them a lot. I wear them. I live in them every day. I don't live in sweatpants. I live in my jeans. And that is something who someone who I am and I'm not doing it to showcase the brand on my butt, mm -hmm. but I'm doing it because I feel good. I feel comfortable in it. And that's like mm -hmm. of the utmost importance to me. Thank you so much for being your authentic self, Cindy. That inspires us. And I love everything you are. And I hope the listeners 
will not only just keep following you on social media because you know we are people are listening right now if you're listening to us on a podcast but if you want to experience Cindy even more and see what true authenticity looks like I would love for you to go follow her on social media look at her pictures look at her speak look at her talk read her blogs and you will see what living in your truest self-expression looks like I'm so glad that you know we made this happen so far on the episode we've talked about what the journey can look like and you're an example of someone who has taken the journey and who is home I love that thank (laughs) you I am I am I'm at home in this This yeah in your skin love it all right I want to end this by talking about your foster cats tell us a little bit about that I'm just and you have a memoir coming up so tell us about that as well yeah so um the other trauma that I healed was when I was in kindergarten, my dad got this dog that either chased away or killed all my cats. I always loved cats from the first one I had when I was two. And so I didn't have any cats anymore. And I was also scared to go outside. And I had a lot of resentment around this. And without going all into it, I think the reason I choose to foster cats and kittens instead of all the many other ways that I could volunteer my time if I wanted to is definitely for me, it's part of healing that wound that I had as a child. And it's also the very deep spiritual connection that I have with these cats. Like when they come to me traumatized from their experiences before they came to my care, I actually work on them energetically. And if they are ill, I'll put amethyst crystals in (laughs) with them And I really try to treat the whole cat um, (laughs) in the same way that I think we should all treat our whole selves. And it's also partly practical. You know, you you know, just before uh, we were talking about how I have cat milk downstairs in a bottle and I can feed them if necessary. So, you know, it's plenty of practical things, too. But it's also I think it's my soul's work. And it's the other thing that I think I'm here to do as well as you know, everything around what I would really call self-expression, which I've chosen to niche down into books for. Right. right. And our self-expression can manifest in many, many forms. And yours does in helping others write books, write stories, tell stories, and foster cats, and being your beautiful, sparkly Cindy. I have to say, before we end, you help me change my relationship with my dog. Really? Yeah. And you probably wouldn't even remember this, but early last year, we were at a a retreat, actually. It was a small retreat. And we would, I don't know what way the discussion was. We were just talking about pets. And, you know, I was talking about how much I am not in love with my dog because he was just too much for me. And I never wanted one. I never wanted a pet. I never wanted the responsibility. And I don't remember what we were talking about, but you said that the difference between cats and dogs is that if you go away from a cat, it'll follow you more. But if you leave the dog alone, the dog is going to leave you alone as well. And I just came home from that retreat with many aha moments. But one of them was that there's this poor creature that we got and my family loves and my boys absolutely adore And he probably thinks that I hate him. And that's why he doesn't come to me. And my relationship with my dog changed in that moment. And I am just so much in love with him. I mean, of course, I still hate the responsibility. And I still feel like, (laughs) oh, my God, why did you eat my book? He loves eating my books. But, you know, we he, he comes to me now and he puts his head on my lap every morning when I'm reading my book. And he rests there and the other day uh, there was nobody home and he just came and he just looked at me with the most loving eyes and he wanted to be picked up and put on my lap and I just feel like there's so much unconditional love that I allowed him to give me Mm -hmm. after that conversation so thank you for that that is beautiful I'm so happy to hear that and you know I have noticed online it seemed like your relationship with your dog had changed but I had (laughs) I'm um, I'm so um oh, I'm so happy I had a part in that. That's incredible. Thank you. And I I have to say you have that impact on people. I'm sure many people have told you that, but you have that impact with your words, with your stories that you you touch lives and you change perspectives. So 
I am just so fortunate that you are in my life and I'm happy that we were able to do this and the listeners are able to hear your story and your wisdom. Thank you so much, Cindy, for being here. Thank you. Where can the listeners find you? Yes, I'm on Instagram at Cindy Childress PhD, and you can stop by my website, cindychilders.com, or grab my free quiz, cindychilders.com backslash quiz. What is the quiz about, Cindy? Oh, thank you for asking. <laughs> Discover your number one best selling author personality trait. And let me tell you, the welcome email sequence that follows will help you unlock your author superpowers. Oh my God, I didn't know that. I'm going to go grab that quiz. And if any of the listeners has a writer in them, I think we all have a writer in us. But if you want to write stories or books, go ahead and grab that quiz. We'll put the show notes, a link in the show notes. Thank you again, Cindy. It's always a pleasure. And I hope you have a great, great, great year ahead. You too. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you liked this one or any other episode, there are three ways you can support us. Number one, come home. Start your journey. That's literally the whole point of this podcast. To inspire you, to empower you, and to give you the knowledge and tools so you remember who you really are. Number two, I'd be so grateful if you could leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. That helps us get in front of more people. Number three, share it with someone. A friend, a family member, a loved one, a peer. You never know how much someone needs to hear this today. Thank you again, and until next time, remember, you're whole, you're enough, you're worthy, you're unlimited, and you are perfect just the way you are. I'll see you next time.